Okay, I think we'll, we'll, get, we'll get started. Uh, good morning, good to see everyone. We talked uh, a bit on Monday about the nature of, of Catholic reform in the 16th century in the Reformation and principally the, the Council of Trent, which creates this idea of a, of a universal church. We're going to be talking about this next week, that the idea of a kind of global Christianity uh, emerges in its, its earliest form. But it's easy for us to sort of think in terms of either or, or in absolutes. This idea of what the Catholic Church should be that emerges out of Trent is in many ways, of course, an ideal. It's more of an ideal than the reality. And that for a very long time, the Catholic Church would remain divided in its theology and practices. Reform took literally centuries to take effect. So it's not, we're not talking about some rapid transition. Yes, over this period of time, new ideas emerge and they become real. But in any kind of reform movement, it, there, are, there is progress and uh, movement backwards. There are different interpretations. So I don't want to create the idea that the sort of Catholic reform was some monolithic movement that didn't have, that wasn't disparate or diverse in character. And that uh, sort of introduces us to, to the person I want to talk about today. Because I mentioned on Monday that the ideal that comes out of Trent with religious orders, and particularly with respect to female religious orders, was based on this old notion of the dangerousness of the female body, the irrationality of the female, the sort of gendered notion that males are rational, they are uh, the appropriate figures to guide the hierarchy of the church, they are appropriate for the sacramental, sacerdotal aspect of the church, and that the female is, is dangerous. And that plays very much into our story today because we're going to talk about probably the most influential woman of the early modern period, Teresa of Avila. And one of the things she teaches us is that within the Catholic Church and within particularly the Spanish Church that we're talking about today, there were still a variety of perspectives. Because what we see in Teresa is somebody who wants to defend the church and believes what she's doing is actually a defense of the church. But the life of which you were looking at part of for this week is actually written in the context of the Inquisition and examination of her writings by Dominican confessors. So that the whole posture of her text is actually something of an apology, a defense of what she's done. And here we have somebody of extraordinary character of visions who claims at the end of her work to have grasped the Trinity Extraordinary claims of a woman whose work, the life, but other works, the, the interior castle, were bestsellers. There are even English translations of them in the early modern period. Her book stands amongst the greatest works, certainly of Spanish writing, alongside Don Quixote of Cervantes and others. Her books stood at the forefront. They were read everywhere. She very nearly, in the 17th century, became the patron saint of Spain. She's canonized extremely quickly, 1622, not that long after death. Most saints take hundreds of years to be canonized. So her, her, her significance is evident but there's also within her life an enormous amount of controversy. She is not only a reformer, but she is the founder of religious houses for both women and men. She presents herself in the text as unlearned and simple and the worst of all sinners. Yet, as I say, she is one of the great writers of her age. 
She takes a posture in the text of defending herself, but what she actually is doing in the text is she's actually instructing her examiners. The life is both an account of her experiences, but it's also a way of teaching people how to pray. It's instruction in how to pray. It is to reach what she calls the contemplation of God. And in that sense, she stands in a long tradition of female and male mystics of the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. But she also is it's problematic, and this is one of the reasons that she gets involved with the Inquisition, because she has a Jewish background, a converso's background, the, the, co the forced conversions of Jews. So that makes her, so that raises the question that we talked about last week of the, the Spanish church having an emphasis on purity of blood. So she's a liminal figure. She's, she's, she's dangerous in various ways. She is a reformer. She is an advocate for change. She is a woman. She is a woman with a conversos background. And she uses, and you get a sense of this in the text, the notion of the female body as integral to the mystical experience. She stands in that tradition of mysticism, which is, in her case, not erotic as it is in other, uh, in other writers, but it certainly embraces the body. And we're going to talk about that, the supreme moment of revelation for Teresa is described in almost erotic terms when the spear enters from the angel enters her body and she enters into a state of ecstasy which is captured I'll show the image in a few moments in a famous statue by the sculptor Bernini the ecstasy of Saint Teresa so there's yet another say dangerous but troubling aspect to her mysticism is in fact that her femininity, her body becomes integral to the, to the very language and imagery that she talks about this communion with God and with Christ. I want to say a little bit more about the Spanish church, the context in which Teresa lived. After when Charles V divided his empire, his son Philip II becomes king of Spain. And he is really uh, the dominant figure during this period that we were talking about last week and this week. Philip has this sense of divine calling that he is to restore the Catholic Church but he's also an intensely Spanish character. So he thinks about that Catholic Church very much in the way that we talked about before, that Spain is the natural leader of the church. Philip played an essential role in the last sessions of the Council of Trent. He did uh, support reforms, but his goal was to see Spain and her empire as the reimagining, the re-emergence of Catholicism in, as I spoke about last week, that sort of notion of crusading. It's Philip who will preside over the, the church as it becomes increasingly global. Talked about this uh, before. But one of the interesting aspects for our story about Philip is that he's actually a key supporter of Teresa which is one of the reasons she's able to do what she does during her life, particularly in Teresa encounters a large number of critics, people who try to stop her. It's because of, at least in part, because of Philip's support that she is able to be uh, successful. <laughs> 
if we're looking for a sense of Philip's vision of himself as the Catholic monarch and of Spain as being the center of Catholic renewal, we can do no better than to look at one of the extraordinary creations of the age, a palace which is just outside of Madrid, the capital, sits in, a, in amongst the hills, and it's called the Escorial. The Escorial was not, was many different things. As you can see, it's enormous, and I've got, uh, I'll just jump forward to a, a, a contemporary picture of it. You can see the, the scale of it is extraordinary. But it's not just a palace, and this is why I think it helps us to understand this Spanish vision, this royal vision of Spanish Catholicism. Because it was a, a royal palace, it was a school, it was a monastery, the Hieronymite order, and it was one of the leading chapels, we can see it's more than a chapel, church in Spain. Amongst the many things that happen is that, is that under Philip, all the, the bones or remains of his ancestors, of the Habsburg family, are brought to and buried in the chapel. So it's a unity of Spain, Christianity, and the dynastic family, the Habsburgs, all seen as part together. Philip, who was a deeply uh, uh, pious figure, had it arranged from his apartment so that when he sat at his desk, he could see the high altar where mass was being celebrated daily. It was a collection of relics. It was a place of pilgrimage. But of course, it was also a sign of Spanish imperial power, in which, in their mentality, Christianity and power and imperialism and colonialism and the purity of the Spanish uh, tradition of, of Catholicism, which, you know, reinforced by the Inquisition, which had sought to eradicate heresy, to convert Jews, and to convert to some extent and drive out. Muslims. It's all in bed. And you can see here that in many ways the model of it, you can see the way in which the church is at the very heart of it. Here are the royal apartments where Philip was. He could see into the high altar. Here's the college, manuscripts. He gathers books and things from all over the world and brings them there. It's meant to be a kind of vision of the cosmos, this palace. And there you have above the cloister, all this, this kind of unified vision of a particular form of Christianity, the one that we've been talking about last week and we will continue to talk about uh, next week. This is, this is this ideal that Spain has a special calling to reform the Catholic Church. This will be feed into the notion of the Jesuits who we'll talk about next week. Uh, Teresa is part of this. She doesn't necessarily share that vision, but she's part of what becomes a flourishing of Catholic culture in Spain in the 16th century. You know, what used to be called, and, and is in very problematic language, a sort of golden age of Spain. Here is just, uh, as you can see, uh, a modern version, of, just to give you a sense of the scale. But Teresa's roots run also in other directions. As I've said, she comes from a converso background. She is the inheritor, because despite this, this narrative and attempt of a kind of pure Spanish Catholicism, the reality is that the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain and Portugal are, was always one of mixed cultures. Islam, Arabic. Jewish, Christian. And even amongst the Christians, there, of course, there's, there's, there are distinctions. Catalonia, where Barcelona is today, is a distinctive, well, it isn't just today, it was always there, uh, but distinctive culture 
within. So linguistic groups. So there's no, there's no one Spain. There's a creation of a kind of ideology of a one Spain, but in reality, there is no one Spanish culture. It's a, it's a mixture of multiple cultures combined with a strong uh, tradition of Jewish and Muslim. For, for almost all of the Middle Ages, the southern part of Spain was Islamic. And we see that, if we had time to look into it, in, in the architecture, in the music, in art, in clothes, in every aspect, in song. So Teresa inherits a long tradition of Jewish and Islamic mysticism that has been r rich in the Iberian Peninsula. She's also influenced by the flow of books of German mystics. Germany in the through the Middle Ages, from Meister Eckhart through to the, the end of the Middle Ages and early modern period, one could say even into Luther, has a strong mystical tradition. And those books are coming into, into Spain. And they are a major influence on Teresa and the person I'm going to talk about very briefly in a few moments, her disciple John of the Cross. So her mysticism, again, comes from a kind of eclectic background. There's no one source. It's something we've talked about along and we talked about at the beginning. There's no, there are no monocausal forces in history. Teresa draws from many different sources that have been inherited and ones that she appropriates and turns into distinctively her own. And as I mentioned before, a long line of female mystics, Mechtel de Magdeburg, Julian of Norwich, Marjorie of Kemp, many, many others, Hadwich. This long tradition of female auth authors, or at least those who wrote down their experiences, which were open to her. This is also very important, this tradition for Ignatius Loyola, when we think about the start of the Jesuits. He, too, is an inheritor of this mystical tradition. But of course, mysticism always occupies a kind of liminal space within the church. On the one hand, it speaks to its highest experience of Christianity, unity with God the imitation of Christ, often described as a kind of bodily and sensuous engrafting into the body of Christ. Or if you get in Meister Eckhart, a kind of, a kind of vanishing of the self into the oneness of God. This supreme experience of the divine, of divinization, theosis, different terms you want to speak about, this unity of God and humanity. But yet, that raises, of course, many difficult questions. What's the role of the church? What's the role of the priests? What's the role of the sacraments? What's the role of the external forms of the church if you have this interiority where you have unity with God, which seems to rely not only not on the externals of the church, but it even moves, as we see with Teresa, beyond words themselves. There is silence in the end. Well, how do these people, with their experiences, their visions, their dreams, their corporeal experiences, where their bodies experience unity with Christ, how do they fit within the church? Mystics are always dangerous figures. And who's to determine that their visions are in fact authentic and not demonic? Delusions. That's one of the things that's central for Teresa is this, she, Teresa becomes famous as a kind of exorcist for driving out demons. But demons figure uh, prominently in, in her account of her visions. Where is the line between the demonic and the sacred? We get this in, we'll get this going forward in a variety of ways. Where do you draw those boundaries? How do you know these visions are coming from God? We'll talk a little bit about later about the culture of ghosts in the early modern world. Are these messengers of God? 
or are they manifestations of the demonic? Remember, we live in a world where the demonic and the sacred are everywhere. It's not a metaphor. It's very real. And of course, she comes out, she belongs to the tradition of the Carmelites. Carmelites referring, of course, to Elijah, Mount Carmel, one of the few religious orders that's actually named for a figure from the Hebrew Bible. And the Carmelites beginning in the medieval period, emphasize contemplation. And that will be crucial to understanding Teresa, because for Teresa, the highest activity of Christianity is contemplation. But she combines contemplation with act activity in the world. She is a person who grounds institutions, founds religious houses, is concerned that the, particularly the women, but also men in these religious houses do acts that contribute to the community. But she also sees that prayer isn't just some abstract thing. Prayer changes the world. Prayer defends the church against heresy. So prayer isn't just some sort of uh, connection between you and the divine. It is a communal act as well as an individual act, and it, has, it transforms the world. So if we're, ten if we're tempted to see this as simply some form of individual interiority alone, then we miss what Teresa is about, the, that... that um, that inner spirituality is outwardly transformative. And this, sometimes people have attempted to draw connections between Teresa and Protestantism, and in particular, the Reformed or Calvinist tradition, which emphasizes, as the Jesuits do, this manifestation of prayer in the transformation of the world into an increasingly godly community, even if you never get there. The images, this is just one image of Teresa Evola, the images of Teresa are everywhere. She becomes an iconic figure. Just uh, similar to when we talked about Luther a few weeks ago. His image becomes integral to who people think he, but in this case she, was. And you can see the kind of iconography uh, that, that's here. She is speaking Misericordiae Domini. This, she is speaking here um, is the, the descent of the dove. She is in a posture of prayer because she's the great teacher of prayer. And that's one of the reasons she, she's so uh, revered. I don't want to go to uh, too much of, of, of her life, just a, a few things. She talks about her, her childhood quite a bit in her life. That in many ways she was an, it was an unhappy childhood. It was full of books. It was full of what she saw as va vanity. And she's extremely self-critical almost morbidly so. There is a, she doesn't engage in kind of physical self-flagellation, but she certainly engages in mental self-flagellation. And it reminds us of something that's very different from our culture. We tend to think of our children as innocent, as entertaining, funny, loving, kind, ex uh, a, an age of exploration and inquisitiveness. The medieval and early modern world had a different view of childhood. And of course, they loved their children. It's not to say that some sort of cold indifference. 
But childhood, in many ways, was a dangerous time. It was dangerous, of course, because childbirth was so incredibly dangerous, and mortality rates in childbirth were very high, but also the vast majority of children never lived beyond the age of 10. Most families could have anywhere between 10 and 15 children, of whom maybe three, four, five would survive into adulthood. So childhood is a very different experience where there is incredibly high child mortality, which there remains, well, still remains, uh, tragically, in our world, but remains very prominent until the, well into the 19th century. But even into the 20th century, child mortality remained an issue. It's not something that we think about very much now, although, it, of course, it does happen. But in the early modern world, childhood had a different, it was a more liminal status. It was thought that when you get into adulthood was a time of reason in which one could express one's faith. So that, that's part of what lies behind when, when Teresa is so critical of herself as a child. It's a kind of time of, of spiritual dangerousness, a time in which the demonic is particularly active. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different mentality, and you find that in her text. But I want to get on to you know, just some of the background. You can, you can look at this um, in your own time. But just to say that she, her own experience of she's around the age of 20 when she enters into the religious house, she is extremely ill. And she interprets this supremely ill, and she expects to die. She has two very serious illnesses. And the visions and the dreams are very closely connected to bodily illness. The fragility of the self. She sees in many ways that's what makes her own suffering, that complicated idea towards suffering that we've talked about before. It's in those moments of physical weakness and vulnerability that the visions come. So she's kind of narrating her body as long as, as the visions. So it's not a sort of out-of-body experience for her. It's very much connected with the suffering of her body. But she doesn't write about it until later. She takes up the writing really around the age of 50, which you know, in that world is a relatively advanced age, so that the life that she writes is reflecting back on events, that, some events which happened quite long ago. So she's narrating her life. I, I've got this here. So um, just to say a couple of crucial influences for her is reading Augustine's Confessions, which she cites, and also her contact with the Jesuits and the spirituality of Ignatius of Loyola. These are two significant influences, but I want to, to emphasize she's drawing on a large range of influences. She has in the work, which we'll, we'll talk about, as not only in her childhood, but again, this kind of rhetoric of self-criticism. She acquires a reputation as a reformer. She, she is obviously an extraordinary person who has an ability not only to, to run religious houses, but to found them, but she also works with political figures. She's able to handle those who oppose her. She is an extraordinary capable person in the world, which reminds us that she's not some other other worldly mystic, but that these mystical experiences are integrated to a world of activity in the church. What are often referred to as the Theresian reforms was the attempt to bring the, the Carmelite order, restore it to its original rigor and purpose of prayer and contemplation. She says in her life, you know, they'd become sort of houses where elite privileged people would, would live and live basically social lives as if they were in the world. She wants to restore it to its original uh, principles. 
And one of the things that she does, which is most famous, is the removal of shoes. So they become the discalced Carmelites, those who do not wear shoes, which became a symbol of their spirituality. She is also very interested in the Americas. She believes that reform of religious orders should be spread to the Americas. She doesn't get there. She doesn't actually know all that much about it, but she has this idea that the spiritual renewal of the Carmelites could be part of these colonized areas. So you can see here the extent of her work between 1567 and 1582, so relatively late in her house, she founds 14 houses. There's a conflict. I, but a couple of things which are, are, are notable about this. Unlike the extraordinarily hierarchical nature of the church, Teresa actually advocates what we might call a kind of egalitarianism, even a kind of democracy, to use a word that she wouldn't be familiar with, so that all participate in the running of these religious houses. She has said religious houses were often occupied by social hierarchies. Uh, Teresa, her ideal was of a community that governed itself and was governed by essential principles, and I've just put them here. Personal devotion, knowledge of the Bible. Teresa, and you see this in her work, is extremely knowledgeable of the Bible, and the Bible plays a crucial role in her, in her writing. But also a reciprocal relationship with the clergy. And, that, and what she means by that is that these religious women, and to a certain extent men, through lives of prayer, could be spiritual advisors to the clergy. Again, a kind of radical idea. So she sees the religious life as empowering. For this, she comes under a great deal of scrutiny, not least by the Inquisition in Spain, her Dominican examiners. There's a great deal of conflict. She is a highly controversial figure, charismatic, but also draws a great deal of opposition. So the, the, again, she's not living some peaceful life away in a monastery having her visions. All of this is happening together with a life that in some ways is intensely political, full of controversy, and she's managing it. I want to get to, um, in the time we have, to make sure we have uh, sufficient uh, uh, um, opportunity to talk about the content. But one of the most remarkable relationships uh, Teresa has is with another figure who is one of the greatest mystics, not only of his time, but enduringly so, John of the Cross. He is a kind of disciple of Teresa. She mentors him. He has a very challenging life. He's thrown in prison. But he writes that work, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, read it with, uh, with people in, in some of the courses. And that is the spiritual canticle and the dark night of the soul, which is in poetic form, this extraordinarily vivid account of sort of heaven and hell. And the extraordinary pain physical, mental, spiritual pain of these visions. And of course, John likewise becomes a sort of liminal figure, one of great, deeply sus uh, suspected. But as I say here, he describes, I, I really recommend, even if you have time only to read a few passages, it would have, and now when I think about it, it would have been nice to have put some of that uh, on the course. This it, these ex extraordinary metaphors and images of the journey of the soul to God. In some ways, much more vivid and visceral than Teresa, which reflected his character. This is just a, a contemporary image of him. I just put a, a passage up here. You can read all of it, I mean, in, in your own time, but just get a sense. It is completely deprived of all this by this thick darkness. 
Yet it's love alone which burns at this time and makes its heart to long for the beloved. It's that which now moves and guides it and makes it to soar upward to its God along the road of solitude without its knowing how or in what manner. This, this mystical experience that moves beyond all knowledge. Very Therese in, in, in some ways, but John has his own style. So let's talk a bit more about this autobiography, one of a classic work of self-writing in the early modern period, it, which is both a mixture of her life, her visions, and her instruction on how to pray. So the book has multiple intentions. As I say, it's written when she's under suspicion. It's written in a context where she is seeking to persuade, or at least seeming to persuade her Dominican examiners of her orthodoxy. But she's doing much more than that. She is a great writer. She is not simply defending herself. She is in control of this text. She has the rhetorical skills to weave a story that is not simply defensive, but is in fact a vision of Christianity and a vision of how people should live. There were many questions about her that, that led to her examination. I've just put them here. You know, demonic influence. She was suspected that these, as I talked about before, that these visions were demonic. Was she a fraud? Was she inventing all of this? Did this pose a threat to the established church? And, as was always worried in Spain, where there were certain groups, one that I, I mentioned earlier called the Alambrados, the enlightened ones, there was, this, there was a tradition of, in Spain where the church suspected mysticism, the inner illumination of, of the individual, as akin to heresy. These are the things that she's being uh, accused of. I'm going to just move on because I want to continue. Um, to talk about the work. It is intended to present a way in which people can be taught to pray. And the structure of the work reflects Teresa's, not only her own spirituality, but what she sought to impart to the Carmelite order. And that is the movement from what she calls vocal prayer through to mental prayer. Now, she uses these terms. It's not easy to parse exactly what she means, but we can think about it in terms of moving from the external to the internal. The external being the external rites of, of liturgy, of prayer, of devotion, the manifestation of the religious life in the world, the sacraments. She's not, and she, it's not to abandon these, but it, they are essential to the life of the Christian. But the goal is to move towards what she calls mental prayer, which is the contemplation of the divine. That movement is what she describes in terms of, I'll come back to this in a moment, four rivers. So that follows in a tradition of mysticism that goes right back to the works of the uh, obscure and unknown figure of, of Dionysius the Areopagite in the late uh, antique period of the mystical experience in terms of steps, of progression, that there are various stages. For those of you, and I'm sure many of you are, familiar with mystical literature, it's often in, used in terms of metaphors or symbolic language to talk about the steps of the ascent. In Teresa's, she uses the image of water as central. Those images of the rivers represent the progression of the soul. 
Now, if when we look at ter- uh, those of you who are familiar with Ignatian spirituality and the spiritual exercises, there Ignatius divides it into weeks, four weeks. And the progression of the individual through each week. They're not, they're not weeks in terms of seven days, as we think about it a month from now. They are symbolic of spiritual stages. Some people might never get beyond the first week. Just as for Teresa, someone may never get beyond the first river. That's not a failure. That's not, oh, you didn't get a good enough grade in this. Each person will find the, the level to which God draws them. So it's, there's, there isn't one mystical experience. She does not anticipate that everybody is going to have unity with God and envisage, as she did, the Trinity to grasp it in a moment. That's not for everybody, but everybody can t- participate in this spiritual progression. I've talked about that. And that progression, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, you have to, given the time, sort of, not give it the fullness that she, ex- that she, of course, has in her writing, is a relationship of God speaking to the soul. God is the active agent. The rise of the soul is a summoning of God. It is the return of what is partial to what is whole. It is a unitive experience. You'll see in her work, she talks about speaking all the time. The four waters. She's, you know, like all mystical writings, she's constantly using a different register of images and metaphors because, like all mystics, words can never contain, they can never explain, they can never hold the reality they point to. They're only symbolic. As soon as you say God is something, You're also saying what God is not, because God is beyond what those words, those attributes. If you talk about God having a hand, or you talk about God's mouth, or you talk about any other physical image of God, you are using an image that helps us, perhaps, to understand divinity. But it can only be contingent and partial and incomplete and insufficient. And that's where Teresa is going. It's, it's, it's to move beyond images, to move beyond words. So to move beyond the intellect, to grasp what is beyond language. And that's, that's what uh, mental prayer is. And for her, the way in which she is drawn forward is through these visions, these series of visions of Christ. And the central one, and I just want to to move on because of time, is what's called the transverberation, which happens relatively late in her life, 1558. And here is, she describes in the life, this extraordinary moment of revelation in which the totality of her body and spirit are penetrated by the divine. There is obviously clear erotic language in it, but it expresses for for Teresa that this is a wholly embodied experience. The angel pierces her heart and um, I've just put up the passage so that, uh, that you can uh, have a look at her description of it. I'm not going to, to read through all of it. They do not tell me their names, but I am well aware that there is a great difference. In his hand I saw a long golden spear, and at the end of the iron tip I seemed to see a point of fire. With this he seemed to pierce my heart several times so that it was penetrated to my entrails. This physicality of this experience. So sweet are the colloquies of love which pass between the soul and God that if anyone thinks I'm lying, I beseech God in his goodness to give him or her the same experience. This is the culminative moment in her text. And it's captured famously by the sculptor Bernini, 
perhaps not the best picture, but there you see the angel in that kind of, we talked about this briefly at the end of last week with Caravaggio and others, the, the sensuousness of, of Catholic art, which emphasizes a kind of incarnational theology and devotion. You can see this, the raining down of light, the spear standing over it. You can, you can find all sorts of ways to describe what's happening here in kind of the physicality, even eroticism of this, and it's called the ecstasy of St. Teresa. And you can see on her face that moment of ecstasy when her heart and entrails are pierced. I've mentioned this already, but very closely in this is, is Teresa acquires this reputation not only for extraordinary sanctity and unity with God, but also, and you see this in her work, she's constantly talking about demons, but she reinforces her own authority in them because she's often mocking the demons. She has the ability to see them for who they are, just as Christ does in the New Testament. She taunts them. And the claim that she makes by the end of her life is extraordinary. What has happened at the end of this? She grasps the Trinity. She gets a vision of God's relationship to creation. She has that ultimate moment. Think of Dante at the end of Paradiso. Teresa has this. And she's, this isn't a book just defending herself. She's telling that she has had the supreme experience. She's not saying that's what's going to happen if you read my book and follow the instructions. But she herself has had that experience. This is the culmination. For most people, it will not go that far. It won't go anywhere near it. But yet, all these people can learn to pray. They can achieve mental prayer, contemplation of God. But she has been given something truly distinctive. She has been given the vision of God. And that, of course, is her establishing her authority. And that's why her work becomes extraordinarily popular, and she herself is seen as this charismatic leader of the church. And that's why she is one of only three women who are declared doctors of the church. She is a doctor of the church. So I'm going to leave that here, but I think, you know, I hope you'll have time to read much more than, than we've had been able to do in the class. But it is a truly extraordinary work, and if you want to read a good book about it, uh, Carlos Eyre, our colleague in, at Yale in the History Department, has written a wonderful little book about Teresa's uh, life. So thanks very much. Uh, I'll see you next week.